Hi, and welcome to Sweet Cheeks Meats. I'm Nick. I'm also Nick. And today we are going to be breaking down a whole elk for you, getting you maximum yield out of your kill. So first thing we're going to do is we are going to separate the hind quarter from the rest of the body so that we've got a more usable size here. And with your saw, you're gonna go right at the top of the apex. So if you're in the field quartering your animal to pack out, this is still another great way to do it. If you separate your spine from your hip bone here and then go through the rest of your spine, leaving that hip bone intact, when you pack out, this will preserve meat for you when you go to clean it. If you're out in the field and you start jabbing around in here to get this out, what you're doing is you're creating a pathway for bacteria to grow as this, as this meat hangs and ages. What'll happen is when you go to clean it, you're gonna end up carving out all that meat where you've cut into the leg because now you've got bacteria going in through all that. So this may be an extra pound or two on your pack out, but it will yield way more than that when you go to clean this up. I'm gonna go ahead and split this guy. If you don't have a saw with you in the back country, hatchet works great. And you can just hold that meat up and separate through it. So next we're gonna saw off our neck here. This will just make it more manageable as we need to maneuver this back and forth on the table. So what we're gonna do, take one clean cut across our neck, get down to the bone, use our saw to get through the bone, and then we'll finish up the cut with our knife again. So Wyoming law requires you to remove the hind quarter, the fore quarter, the back strap, the loin, as well as the tenderloin and take that meat out with you. Don't stop there. This cut right here, this neck, is one of the best cuts coming off of this entire animal. Take this home with you, use it as stew meat. Um, take your shanks. We cross cut these into asabuco. We will show you how to do that shortly, but this guy, both of these for braising, most flavorful cut, best thing you can take off this animal out of the field. Also, to make this more manageable for us, we are going to remove the shanks really quickly. So again, using our knife to cut through meat, follow through with our bone saw. Come back through with our knife to finish their cut. Second one, right through there. So where I'm cutting, just below that, we're gonna cut right through there. And then what we'll end up doing is just knocking it into a piece like this. And for this size of animal, we're gonna put it into two pieces. Um, for an antelope, you could just keep this whole. For a deer, depending on how big the deer is, you may wanna go into one or two pieces. Big thing with your saw, keep your spare hand clear and out of the way in case this saw jumps on you. You don't want to end up taking a chunk of your hand so out. So now we are going to cut the belly off. And if you look over here where the hip bone meets the spine, you've got the head of your tenderloin starting. And this is the end of the back strap or your strip loin. You're going to find the feather bones. Last set right up here off the rib cage or flexible. You're gonna come in right below that, make a cut, and just follow that down until we get to where the back strap starts. You don't wanna cut into that. So if you're out in the field and you're quartering this animal, this is all great usable trim meat to be taking with you. Take your belly off, 
belly off, stick it into the trim bag. Same thing in between the ribs here, coming off, pulling all this meat between the ribs so that you've got that extra meat once you get home to turn into burger, sausage, all those other wonderful things. All right, now that gives us a better view. You've got your tenderloin right here, which runs right along the spine. Best way to get that out is to start at the spine, work your way out, and it slowly pulls out. And when you get towards the end, you kind of get your fingers up, gently roll it off the other bone. Cut the head away. And you kind of feel it with your fingers behind, nowhere to cut. And I'm gently pulling away from the animal. Just using the sharpest part of the blade. Pull our tenderloin out. This is a great cut to take out with you, day of harvest. Um, as you can see, the aging process is going to be a little bit more loss on it. And this is a nice tender cut that you could eat of day of the hunt. So now we're going to pull the back strap off this animal. Starts right here, runs along the spine to the point of the shoulder blade, which is about four vertebra off of the neck. So here, since we cut the belly away, kind of gave ourselves a nice straight line to work with. So I'm just going to come across, cutting right on the bone and pulling down gently. While Nick's cutting that, we'll talk about some general knife skills as you can watch what he's doing. So you'll notice this is a strong knife hold right here. You don't want to be sitting here with your finger on the tip just flicking. You want to make nice clean cuts. So here is a good hold. Here is a good hold. And you're going to pull across your body so as to not, if you were to slip, that this knife would not slip off and hit you in the gut. Especially if you're out in the field and four miles in, that's a real hard one to recover from. Different if we're on our table and we can run to urgent care, but always being safe, pulling away from your body. Um, if I'm pulling this way, what I will do is I will move my body out of the way so that again, I'm pulling across my body. What you can see Nick doing now is he's keeping one side of his blade on bone, the other side of his blade cutting through the meat of the animal. This way we don't leave anything extra on the bone that ends up as trim rather than a really nice tender steak for us. Just got a little bit of light pressure rolling the meat out. Just tracing the spine with the tip of my blade. And basically I have knife pressure up against the rib bone as I'm cutting. Right here, I hit the end of the shoulder blade cartilage. That's telling me to stop. You could follow that basically straight down to the spine. Just running my knife along the spine until I meet my end cut. A big, beautiful back strap. So now that we've got our back strap off, we're going to take the rest of our shoulder off. Easiest way to start with this is to come along the breast of the animal right here at the split of the cage. So again, taking my knife along the bone. And then I'm going to peel back this entire breast here. Come up off there.
I'm going to run a cut down behind our shoulder blade. It gives me a connection point here. Peel that shoulder back. The whole time we're knife on the bones just so we're getting max yield. So we're going to come up underneath our shoulder blade. Then as we come up here, we start getting back into that cavity where that back strap was. So you can notice my knife's changing from this angle now to this angle, keeping the tip of my knife up against that spine. So benefits of keeping a sharp knife in the field, take a good quality boning knife with you along with something to sharpen that, whether that's a honing steel, a small piece of diamond stone, because as this blade dulls, we want to put that edge back on it, keep it sharp. Remember, a sharp knife is a safe knife, and that way, less resistance as you're pulling it. So with the other side, other half of this animal, we're going to show you a few more butcher cuts. So we're going to come right through our spine here at the base of our rib cage, separating off our short loin. So that still has tenderloin intact and back strap intact. And what we'll do is go through and knock out little T-bone sticks. So with the help of a partner, we're going to stabilize this and cut right down the spine of this animal to give us our uh, base for making T-bones. Best way to do that is give yourself a starting and an end point. So usually just make a little notch. And same thing on the rear, center up. Now I'm basically going to make the two meet. Get some of that sinew out. Makes your cut a little easier so it's not grabbing at your blade. Also helps to trust your cutting partner. Now we got the strip loin off, we're going to cut the sirloin, which is right here, the bone meets. some t-bone steaks now got our short one got your little piece of tenderloin and your back strap instead of using the saw for this one I like to make a little cut with a knife until I get down to the spine and bring out the trusty old cleaver ah now 
We're professionals here, guys. Grab yourself a dead blow hammer. Got yourself a beautiful little elk T-bone. If you don't have a cleaver at home, you can use a hatchet. Uh, dead blow is highly recommended over a metal hammer. Just keeps you from the chance of shooting metal shards off of your cleaver. Safety first. So this animal was tested for chronic wasting disease by Wyoming Game and Fish. What that means to us, it means that we know that this spine is not contaminated with chronic wasting disease. So now we're going to give you guys some bone-in tomahawk chops. We're going to basically leave seven bones on the rib section. Use our saw to get through the breastplate of the animal right here and then coming through the tip of the shoulder blade. I'm just gonna square up to where your end cut is. On a younger animal, that may just be cartilage where you can just use the tip of your knife and go all the way through. So here we got your entire rib section. The seven rib they call it in the butcher world. We're gonna split it down the middle here and then show you how to cut some chops. So we split it in half. Now I'm gonna pull the rib bones off. We're gonna leave about six inches on there for our tomahawks. So now we got a rib loin. We're gonna trim our rib meat between. Careful not to cut into your loin. If you kind of judge it by looking at the side of it. Easy way to do this is give yourself a starting line, a finish line. Just run your knife straight across. Then you can just come down on the bones. Now you're just going to run your blade down the side, pull all that trim meat out. And we're just going to continue going down the line.
So you can see it's starting to take shape. Going back to the trusty cleaver. Got a rib chop here now. Pick your point in between the ribs. Once you're through, go to your knife. Still got a little bit more. Old Thomas shop. There you go. Here we've got the hind quarter of the animal. If you listened earlier, we were leaving the hip bone of the animal in. This way you get maximum yield after aging it back home. So we got hip bone, leg rounds, and then our hind shank here. We're gonna just get this guy out of the way. If we take our saw, kind of tapers to the meat, to the bone right there. We're gonna make a cut right there. Remember? You paid for the whole saw, so use it. This guy's great dog treat. Um, also really wonderful for throwing into stocks. Either way, a little dried up tendon there. Then kneecap is coming in right about here. So we're gonna cross cut right below there. Get some of our meat out of the way. Dragging down to the table. All right, so then we've got our shank. All right, now we're going to move on and removing the hip bone here. You move it around and see. Same technique we used before, just gonna have our knife on the bone so you can kind of feel where the meat turns to bone. Make our first exploratory cut. Now I'm on the bone. I'm gonna follow that all the way to where the ball and socket is. As we start to see, got the end of our femur bone right here and the socket of the hip bone. And this is what Nick was talking about earlier. If you don't know really what you're doing, you get in there with your knife, you start poking around, you're now introducing bacteria into the clean meat and then you're trimming that up on the opposite end and losing some. So now I'm through the ball and socket, staying on the bone. So if you guys ever find yourself struggling around that socket, there's two different things happening. You've got a tendon coming out of the head of the socket, or the head of the femur going into the socket, and then you have a capsule that goes all the way around this, capturing the head of the femur. So get your tip inside the socket, Cut this tendon off and then make your way around to make sure that you're fully clear there.
So now, basically gonna get into seam butchery, and that's find a seam and work our way to it until we get to the next muscle or to the bone. To help you, we're gonna cut some of this dry age off, give you an idea of what we're working with. So seams what I'm talking about right here. It's a little silver skin and fascia connecting the muscle together. And now I'm just gonna be using the tip of my knife. And I'm pulling the meat one way. This is exposing more silver skin. Notice how Nick uses his left hand to explore where the muscle's going and then follows through with the tip of his knife afterwards. So I'm feeling around in the muscle. I now feel the femur bone running through. So I'm gonna cut just to the side of that. And then I can find the head of the femur bone and start working my way down the side to open everything up. When we get to the kneecap, you're just gonna turn Now the whole femur is exposed. I'm gonna cut down and around on both sides and remove it. Knife tip staying on the bone. Also notice how Nick moves the meat around him. So always available to put it at a different angle to keep yourself safe and also to make what you're working on that much easier. So I got down to the kneecap here. I'm just kind of turning and draw my knife down and out. I want to feel, feel my fingers almost. So now I'm going to take the knife, get it under the femur bone, come up the back side. And now I could use the leverage of the weight of the meat on the table and pull the femur bone towards me to finish my cut around the kneecap. And you've got all your rounds off the leg clean femur bone for the pup or the stock pot. We're going to start going through all the muscles and I'll be telling you what is what. I'm basically just going to start following the seams now. So while Nick's doing that, we're going to talk a little bit about dry aging process and essentially what is it good for. Um, so as you saw earlier, Nick was pulling off the aged chunks of meat here. Is this edible? No, don't eat it. However, give it to your animals. This is great treats for dogs, cats, things like that. Do not use it for stocks. Do not use it in your own cooking, but animals love fermented food. What's a dog do? He buries a bone. He comes back three weeks later to pick it out. That's what they do. For us, what does dry aging do? So this is a breakdown of the protein structure. On an older, bigger animal, that means it's going to help tenderize it for you. It also helps enhance flavor in that process. So smaller animals, your antelopes, smaller deer, we're gonna be in the three to seven days of aging before you start seeing a negative in the breakdown of the protein structure. Um, for larger animals, your elk, your moose, your bison, uh, more in the seven to 14 day window is, is kind of your optimal time frame there. So this muscle Nick just pulled out, this is your eye of round. 
Eye of round, tender muscle. This is great for cutting into carpaccio. This is great for making brajol, different pieces like that. You can also clean it up and just use it as a roast. This big guy coming off right here, this is your bottom round. So bottom round is going to be the long, long skinny rectangular piece. You'll also see large piece of silver skin on this side and a small tendon coming through on that side. Here we have the knuckle. This is basically the calf muscle of the animal. Uh, really good for braising, grind, stew meat. Um, there's not too much interconnective muscular tissue. Unlike the heel, there is a lot of connective tissue. This guy's gonna require a long cut uh, or cook. And then if you're gonna throw in your grinder, you probably have to clean your blade out immediately after because it's gonna catch everything that's in the muscle. And then one of my favorites, the top round. This guy is good for pot roast, doing a straight roast beef style. Um, recipe is one of my favorites. You could pastrami it, you could smoke it. Um, basically the bottom round and top round are the two best eating. You cut some minute steaks off of it and pretty much world your oyster. So how to make this into a more usable cut in the kitchen? We're gonna square off each end so that we get left with one more uniform chunk. So if I cut off this end, this piece will go to trim for our burger. Same idea here. I'm gonna cut this guy off, make it more usable, and then it's coming in and cleaning out this silver skin. So if I poke in with my knife, I use slightly upward pressure on it, and I drag it down across that. Then coming back, same idea, pull it across. We get left with a more clean chunk. We clean off the rest of that end. Same idea here. Poke in with our tip of our knife, slight upward pressure, clean that off, come off with that guy. Um, this is up to you. So this is fascia. This holds a lot of off flavors in the animal. Um, depending on when you shot it, how quickly it got cooled, this can capture a lot of off flavors as the animal is cooling down. So for the best chance of having the cleanest tasting meat, you just take your knife, get a hold of that stuff, and just pull that off there. Only thing we have left is just to take that dry age off, then we've got a roast ready to go, or like Nick said, cut some minute steaks. So take your knife, cut about a three quarter inch to a one inch steak off of there. We call them minute steaks because hit it with salt and pepper, flaming hot grill, one minute, one minute, pull it off, you're ready to eat. So here we have the shoulder of the animal. Uh, this would be outside, inside here. So this section right here, this is what we would call the chuck section. This is the top of the loin as you start getting, the loin comes down to a point, you have neck and shoulder muscles coming together. What that means is a bit of connective tissue and a lot of flavor. So we like to keep this for our stewing meat because it's gonna hold up the best. So if we just come down through that seam right there, and then from this point, we can either tie it up into a nice little roast size, or we can just cross cut it and get some good sized stew meat out of there. Um, in the back, again, looking at your fascia, you can actually see how gases have formed within there. This is stuff that we just kind of make an easy cut through and just pull aside so that we have a cleaner tasting protein. Maybe. Uh, this stuff here, nice trim meat. Come on down through that trim meat. Again, I'm following seams and finding bone. Now I'm at the bone. I just run off the top here. Through that. So that'll be for our burger, for our sausage. Uh, this guy right here, you can see, this is what we call the underblade of the animal. 
So it's a muscle that just holds on that underside of the shoulder blade. So we come in on our shoulder blade, run our blade down, come back through the other side, cut down through that seam right there. And then we just seam that right off. So this is what we call our velvet steak. Nice, tender, really great. Again, thin cut, so high, hot heat for a couple minutes on the side. We're gonna come into the top section of the animal now. So this here, I like using the heel of my knife to kind of figure out where I'm at. So meat's nice and soft, bone has a good knock to it. We're gonna find the end of the bone going into the shoulder blade. So end of the bone's here, I'm gonna make my cut. I get a finger in there to see where I'm at. So I can feel the end of my bone there and the start of the other bone and cut between the two. And now we see another capsule and the end of the front leg bone. And now I'm just gonna make this cut Go straight across. So now we've got part of the chuck section, which they call the clod. We could take the bone out. This is great to go to sausage, grind, um, any stew meat. And this is what we're looking to get to is the shoulder blade itself. So if you can see, got the blade. We're gonna flip over to the back side with our knife again. We're gonna tap around. We're gonna find the center ridge line. We're gonna cut down on both sides of that. We're gonna get our flat iron from one side and our mock tender from the other. Just running my knife down the side of the bone to the base. I'm basically just going to scalloping motion, get the flat iron out. So this side, you got your big flat iron, square it up. So now you got this, there's a tendon that runs through the center of it. Normally I like cooking this guy up whole and then cutting that out afterwards. If you get a large enough animal, you could trim it up now. Um, but this one's probably about medium, so I'd cook that whole and just pull the tendon out. Got our mock tender here. This is probably one of the toughest cuts on the whole animal. I would just send it to your trim for grind or make some pastrami out of it. Jerky. Good for jerky. got your shoulder blade and remember to clean off all the dry age before you cook with them so again poking through with the tip of your knife 
slight upward pressure, and then nice smooth strokes off. Flat arm. Perfect. All right, we got to the point of needing to package up everything after we've cut it up. Need four things your meat, obviously, some plastic wrap, some butcher paper, which is waxed on one side to help prevent freezer burn, and then a good quality tape. I like to get all the air off of it if possible while I'm wrapping, so I just use light press techniques. Could also use a vacuum sealer. Just little finger pokes and a roll. Yeah, this is a great time to invite your buddies down. You know, it's an opportunity to share some of your game meat with them. They can get a chance to taste it, but many hands make light work. Set up the assembly line. One person's wrapping in plastic. Next person's hitting paper. Next person's tagging it like Nick just did there. This is the best way we find to work. It lasts 12 months without any, any signs of wear and tear. So we're going to cover some of the tools that we use, whether it's going to be in the field or at home on the table. These are just useful to have for you, help identify which ones for more success, um, both in the field and while you're at home. So we always pack nitrile gloves with us. Uh, these guys are great because your hands can remain cleaner, especially say you go from skinning the animal where your hands are, are touching all of the different bacteria that live within that hide. Now I'm going to the meat. Well, easy, boom, boom. These ones are off, new set of gloves on, and I'm not transferring anything from that hide into the fresh kill. Uh, safety glasses, always just a good thing to have, whether you're getting bone fragments shooting up, uh, potential knife goes astray because you're excited, you're pumped up with adrenaline, um, just, we need these, keep them safe. Butcher's twine, this is an awesome thing to have. Just take a little small chunk, stick it in your shirt pocket. Honing steel, these knives get dull. Hides are incredibly dulling to a sharp blade. Also, as you're dragging along bone, that's pushing that edge of the knife over. Honing steel, boom, back straight again. You've got a sharp blade ready to go. Why don't you take it from there? Cleaver, hatchet, goes a long way. Breaking bone, um, if you gotta be quick with something, a couple good whacks of this and you're through. Mallet, same thing. If you're not feeling confident with your ability with this guy, down a couple good whacks. Um, razor knife's always good to have because pulling this out to cut a zip tie is not safe. Um, and this guy should always be with you anyways. Got ourselves meat hook for hanging when we get back to our house in the garage, pole shed, barn. Um, better than improvising with baling wire or twine. Obviously the hacksaw. Um, doesn't have to be this big. It can be a little smaller in your pack down kit, but a great way to get through the bone real quick and get your max yield out. We use bench scrapers a lot. Uh, game animals tend to, the proteins are a little stickier than domestically raised animals. This is a great way to keep a clean working surface. We can just come in, scrape our table, uh, sanitize, wash down afterwards, but it gets rid of the bulk of it. We've got three main knives that we use on our tables at all time. 90% uh, of our work is between these two here. So we've got a curved boning knife and a straight boning knife, both of which we use stiff. As you are pulling that knife on a long bone, it, that loads energy. You don't want that knife to roll off of it because it's flexible. 
especially if I'm working on hanging meat, pulling down, if that knife kicks with that flex, there's a great opportunity for it to kick off and hit meat. So that's why we stick with straight or uh, with stiff knives. Lastly, so here we got our 10 inch scimitar. This guy is great for cutting steaks or getting through large cuts of meat in one fell swoop. One of my favorite knives. So this is also a great technique for cleaning when you've got a nice clean or a nice flat surface, just like filleting a fish, keeping the pressure down on the board. And then we're able to just pull away that dry age right there. When getting your animal out of the field, cooling the meat is of highest priority. So for that, we always recommend taking the hide off of the animal. Best way to start that cooling process, remove the hide, cool air moving across the meat is the best thing possible. Um, if you're still in a somewhat warm environment, quartering the animal, moving them apart. So you want, you don't want your legs close together. You want them open so that air can move across and help cool it. Um, remembering also that these bones are the same temperature as everything else and they're encased in that meat. So we need to get as much temperature difference out of that meat to help cool the bones so that we don't get any rotting inside when we go to clean the entire animal up. Um, also with that, do not leave it laying in the back of a truck where the heat of that animal is going to be up against a black surface there and there's no air movement on it. If it's warmer time in the year, Best option, quarter it, get it into a cooler on ice. Well, thanks for joining us today. I'm Nick. I'm also Nick. We're from Sweet Cheeks Meats in Jackson, Wyoming, where we have a whole animal butcher shop. Come on by and see us.